Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Happy birthday. Tell somebody happy birthday. Sweet 16. Say happy sweet 16. It's, uh, I want to kind of just take a moment and echo what Jess said and extend um, whether you are one of the OGs in the room, any OGs in the room? It's been here since the beginning. We've been here a long time. <laughs> um, or you maybe only found this body recently. We are so grateful. Maybe even this is your first week, and hopefully you feel at, right at home. But we want to just thank you for your part and who you are in the body of Christ. We don't take that for granted, that we, are, we each have a part to play. We are each um, a different part of the body, as Paul would describe it, right? And we make up this beautiful bride of Christ. Tell somebody you are a beautiful bride today. And we are, we're in a little bit of a limbo season. Some of y'all might like this, where we just came off of a sermon series on the book of Ephesians. And our next sermon series doesn't start until October 6th. And um, I want to let you know we are starting a series on some of the various parables of Jesus in the New Testament, and uh, one of our dear friends and somebody who actually used to be a pastor here before the Lord called him into the marketplace, John Shunker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lots of love for John Shunker. He's going to be bringing the word, so you do not want to miss it. It's going to be, it's going to be great. But I have the joy today in this limbo to preach on something that the Lord has really Im- impressed upon my heart. I have been a little weepy all week, good weepy, Holy Spirit weepy, <laughs> and, um, ooh. and I'm just excited. How many know he is beautiful? Can we just, before we dive in, we're going to open up the book of Leviticus in a moment, but before we do that, just set your, set your heart on him, on the Lord. And just tell him how beautiful he is to you. Lord, you are beautiful to us. You are holy to us. You are majestic. You satisfy in ways we can't even explain. And we offer up our simple thanks this morning. Our simple gratitude this morning. Help us to tend to the fire of our hearts. Help us to tend to the fire of our love. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 6. The title of the message today is Tend to the Altar Fire. We're going to start in verse 8 and read all the way through verse 13. We're reading from the ESV this morning. In this, this moment, the Lord is speaking to Moses about Aaron, the priest, and his sons, and the different practices they're to carry out in the temple, and particularly in this portion of Scripture, the holy place, the bronze altar. Verse 8, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, command Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be kept on the hearth on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning, say kept burning, shall be kept burning on it, and the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen undergarment on his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar." Then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Verse 12, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning. Say, kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Fire shall be kept burning. Come on, somebody, you already know. Say, kept burning. Yes, burning. On the altar continually, it shall not go out. This is the instruction of the Lord to Moses, for Aaron the priest, for his sons, 
And how many know if, you say, if the Lord says something three times, pay attention? You see that in Scripture. It's like, it's like God has just highlighted it right there for you. Parents, you know what I'm talking about when you say something that third time to your child. You're like, you listen here. <laughs> that third time. You're like, I, I'm really serious. No, I need you to understand this. No, I really need you to understand this. That you are to not let the fire go out. Continuously. And this was a way in which they honored and obeyed the Lord. Thank you. Now, what's significant about the fire? I was, I was thinking upon this for a moment as I was just taking time with the Lord for this message. And for the Israelites, we see the moment that God called somebody to lead them to their freedom. That he doesn't appear in some of the typical ways we see him in scripture. He doesn't send a messenger. He doesn't send an angel. But he actually appears to Moses in the form of a burning bush. A holy place. He says, Moses, take off your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. And it's a fire that doesn't consume the bush, but continually burns. And then we see this moment as Moses is called to lead them to their freedom, to lead them out of oppression, to lead them out of slavery. And how does the Lord guide them? By fire, cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. You see, fire was this picture of the presence of God, the faithfulness and power and goodness of the Lord that dwelt with the Israelites, that he was a God that would not forsake them, that would not leave them. And this picture of the altar fire was this reminder that I, Jehovah, Yahweh, your God, your provider, I will dwell with you continuously forever. But you, the priest, are to tend to this fire to keep continually this fire burning, to remove the ashes, to place fresh wood upon the altar. His presence, the fire of his presence. Leviticus 9.23, commissioning this tent of meeting, and it says, Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people And the glory of the Lord, say the glory of the Lord. It appeared to all the people and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed, say consumed. It consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and they fell face down. Look at the the temple that Solomon built. To the Lord. Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And when all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Look at these moments. The glory of the Lord, the fire of the Lord came and filled his temple. And the response of the people of joy, of falling prostrate before the Lord, of falling their knees on their knees before the Lord, and just this reverence and worship. And I want to start with this simple thought. Have we become too familiar to his glory? Have we become overly familiar? Because he dwells with you. His fire, his presence dwells with you. Come on, just say the simple prayer. Lord, help me not take that for granted. You see, we fast forward to our present day and we don't come to the temple to offer sacrifices in the same way. 
We're not up here slaughtering animals, burnt offerings and sin offerings and peace offerings and all grain offerings and all sorts of things. But we do come and we offer him our sacrifices. We come and we offer him our sacrifices of prayer and worship. And make no mistake, this temple imagery, this temple language of the Old Testament, it is all throughout the New Testament and the New Covenant. It just shifts. The paradigm shifts in this new creation reality. I find the more, like, the longer I sit with Scripture, the more amazed I am, anybody else. Like, to read a book over and over and over and over again, it, it just has never gone dull. If anything, I'm seeing things like I've never seen before in the ways that it's just so interwoven. It's like it was breathed by God. <laughs> It's this beautiful tapestry. And so this language, it's not done away with 1 Peter 2, 5. You yourselves, say you. you. Who? You. That's right. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, or some translations say a spiritual temple, to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Here you have the temple, you have the priesthood, and you have the sacrifice, all in one verse. Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Ephesians 2, 2, in him, y'all, you all also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Who is the temple? Where is the temple? Among the saints. These walls are not the temple. This roof is not the temple. This floor is not the temple. We are the living stones. We are the walls. We are, we are the lights. We're the roof. We're the foundation. We're the floor. We are the new temple of the Lord. And we see this picture of the glory of the Lord filling the temple all throughout the Old Testament. And where can you expect to find God in this new covenant paradigm? Filling the temple. Acts 2, verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Well, wait a second. Who was together? In one place. In one place. Who was together? The temple. The temple. The disciples. All together in one place. The living stones, where it was once fabrics and metals fashioned into things. It was now living stones, living sacrifice, the holy priesthood of God, the temple, gathered in that upper room. And it's no wonder what happens next. Verse 2, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. In verse 3, divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You are a dwelling place of God. I'm here to remind us today that we are the dwelling place of God. We are the temple of God. John the Baptist said in, in Luke 3, 16, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You are the temple of God. God's presence dwells with you. We are the living stones. Amen. And we have an obligation as holy priests to tend to that fire, to appreciate the fire, to be grateful, to not let our love grow cold or dim. 
Matthew 24, verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. And I want to ask you today, not with malice or judgment or shame or anything like that, but with a christ filled invitation, are you burning with love for Jesus? Are you burning with love for Jesus? You know, when, when I was at ministry school, Bill Johnson would often say, it's easy to burn in a bonfire. <laughs> and you're here at this school of ministry surrounded by all these students who are on fire for Jesus, and it's easy to burn here because you are, there's a ton of other fires next to you. You're just one big old bonfire. But will I find you and sit down with you 20 years from now, have a coffee and say, are you still burning for Jesus? And you say, yes, Bill, I'm still burning for Jesus. What is the condition of our love, of our heart? We have an obligation to this temple. I believe we have an obligation both corporately and individually. You know, corporately, we gather here on a Sunday morning not just for a social setting, not just to see our friends, to have a little bit of community. That's right. There's biblical precedence for that. Don't hear me wrong. But we also gather first and foremost to minister to the heart of the Lord to come together in our unity as one in all our different backgrounds, ethnicities, races, cultures, everything, and to come in as one body and offer the lamb who is worthy the praise that he is deserving of. That's the reason. We offer up sacrifices of prayer, prayer for one another. Imagine we were like truly, truly a praying church. And, and some of you might, that your instant response might be like, we are, good, you're killing it, proud of you, go for it, okay? I, I was reading this book the other day of, of just telling this story about a church that, that they took groups of five people and they were just committing each group of five to pray for a college student through their college years. Let us be a church that doesn't just say, yeah, I'm praying for you, brother, and then forget about it but to truly love and support and pray for one another and be called to the standard of living that Christ laid out for us. We pray, we worship, we offer sacrifices of worship for one reason and one reason alone, because he's worthy. He's worthy to receive the reward of suffering. The Lord. You know, I try to remain in this place feeling continually challenged that I, God, help my love not grow complacent. Help me not get so used to this. I don't want to get used to this. And we have a similar prayer for Sunday mornings for our services. God, help us not get used to this. God, you're so good, and you show up time and time again, and we experience your presence. But, oh, Lord, let us not take it for granted. Let us not take it for granted that we are your holy temple. Let us not become so familiar that we don't appreciate it. But see, the reality is, we don't get to blame our participation on somebody else. We don't get to blame our participation in worship on the band that morning and whether they played the songs we liked, whether they were kind of on it or not, like, ah, they just kind of, that wasn't it today. Whether there was an electric player and you were able to worship because there was an electric player, or it was like today and you just weren't able to worship because there was an electric player, whatever it is. We don't get to blame our participation on somebody else. We have an obligation to minister to the heart of the Lord as the holy priesthood. You are responsible for your worship. <laughs> you know, if we can only worship him in perfect concert-like environments, I think we've missed the point. I remember I was, many years ago, I was in high school. Well, that's obviously, duh, but many years ago, I was in high school. <laughs> um, I remember in high school, I was visiting a friend, and they were having some sort of worship night at this church. I can't remember, I think it was maybe a church her parents attended, or anyways, we, we went, and it was different than I was used to. I'm not saying it was bad, but it, to me, it just, it wasn't it to use that language I just said, right? And I know to the Lord, he found it beautiful, sweet melodies to his ear, but the Lord saw my heart 
And he just, he just did what he, he's done so many times in my life. And he just cut through with this whisper. And he just said to me, can you worship me even now? And I, I often, the only response to those moments is, yes, Lord, forgive me. I absolutely can. And I just began, I didn't know all the songs. If I remember, like, I just began to worship him. He was worthy. Back then, I, I used to freestyle with some guys from my high school that got saved, and I was freestyling to the Lord, to the music, and I was, when I didn't know the songs, and I was singing, and I'm not going to freestyle right now. And it's been a while. And, um, but I was just doing whatever I could just to give him an offering of worship that he was deserving of because the obligation was mine. This is our temple practices. As the holy priesthood, when we come together as the temple, when the living stones gather in one place and the glory of the Lord fills the temple, will we honor the fire? Will we honor his presence? When I ask you, what are you looking for? Because you won't find salvation in a sermon. You won't find salvation in a worship set. It's found in Christ, Jesus, who is worthy of our attention, even right now. It's about him. <laughs> it's about Jesus. You know, I'm... I'll be the first to admit I can get distracted at time. Anyone else willing to admit that? Get distracted. <clears throat> but I know that my goalpost is Jesus. My aim is Jesus. The goal is Jesus. We often pray. It's very simple, kind of like, let me just adjust this slightly. Almost a simple prayer, but God, let this not just be another Sunday. Let us be so aware of you today, Jesus. It's pretty much our prayer every week. God, let us not just get used to this. Let us be aware. <laughs> we don't want to create a church where we come just to feel good. We want to create a church where the presence of Jesus is honored. The presence of God is honored. Individually, we also have an obligation to take time to seek him to truly, truly seek his heart, to spend time with him, to listen to him, to converse with him. We're really good at talking to him, but taking time as well to listen to the voice of our shepherd, to offer up our vulnerabilities to the Lord. I love the psalmist. He had this ruthless trust in the Lord, even when he was going through situations of like depravity and betrayal and all, all sorts of things, and he could just lay it all bare before the Lord and then basically say, Lord, I trust you. I praise you. I worship you. You are my deliverer. So take time to dwell in his presence, to, to bear yourself, to, to lay yourself bare before him, to become the living sacrifice that Paul talks about. Know the word of God. How important is this? Very important. Very important. Even Jesus knew this. He was writing the, the New Testament part, you know, but the Old Testament part, he knew it. <laughs> and he used it to combat the lies of the enemy, to encourage himself. So know it. Know the word. It's your sword, as Jess reminded us last week. Worship him. Lastly, submit every area of your life to Jesus. No hidden thing. And don't defile the temple. Don't defile the temple with loose living, with sin, an acceptance of sinfulness. 2 Corinthians 11.3, but I'm afraid that, they, that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. This is Paul's concern. When we get led astray, it's, it's typically not like a, it's not a, a real quick it's we slowly get pulled sideways until before we realize it, we are way off the beaten path. So when you, when you deal with sin, be quick to run to the Lord. Don't run from the Lord, run to the Lord. 
because his embrace is there waiting for you every time. And he longs to bring you back into that, into that embrace to wipe you clean of all shame and all sin and all, all sense of unworthiness or abandonment that you feel and give you his fullness once again and say, go, be my holy priest. Run to him. <laughs> Genuine repentance. The reality is a love so great, like the, like the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, demands a response, a great response of our love, of our worship. You know, I'm, I'm far from perfect in my habits. Sorry if that like breaks the, you know, any ideas you have of me. Don't worry, I have habits. I'm not saying I have none. I have spiritual habits, okay? So don't, don't take that too far down the road either. But I'm not perfect. I've got kids. We're at sports six days a week. Like, I've got four kids. We're crazy. And, um, and there has been this ache and this longing that Jesus will not let me get away with this week. This, like, wooing. Think of the Song of Solomon calling to his lover. He's been calling. Come, come a little closer. Take another step deeper. Aaron, you've been with me, but I long for more. I'm jealous for you. I am jealous for your affections. I am jealous for your time. And I can honestly say that even the things... I've probably prayed this prayer a bit dangerously, and he's, he's answered it. But even the things that s- satisfied no longer seem to satisfy. I, loved, I grew up playing video games. I loved playing Halo with my brother. I'm sorry if that again pops a bubble for anyone in this room. <laughs> um, but even that, I'm just like, it just, it's just, it bores me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm just like, I feel this longing to be with my lover, to take time to be with Christ, to pursue him rightly. And in times maybe where I've fallen into the temptation to give him, like, here's where I can slot you in God, I feel an invitation from the Lord, where can I carve out the best time for you? in the morning (laughs) when the kids go to bed and it's been a long day and all I want to do is go on my phone and (laughs) veg out. And it's like, God, I will offer you the best because you are deserving of my best. He is wooing you today. He is calling you today. There's a fragrance that you can smell that's saying, come and be with be with your lover. Jess has a perfume that she's worn since our engagement or a wedding. She bought it for our wedding day. And whenever we go on a date night, she puts on that smell. This so maybe is a little, you know, too PG-13 for some people in the room. But that smell, that's the smell of my beloved. And there is a fragrance of your beloved, Jesus. That is wooing you into the secret place. Come and dwell with me. You know, there's so many things vying for our time, negative and and seemingly positive things. All of our to-do lists, the cleanliness of the house, the friends that want to hang out, the studies we have to do, the thesis we have to write, that new show we're into, the video game that just dropped, a good book series, the chores... And none of them are wrong, so long as they don't become an idol above Christ. And if you want to be free from the, I have to do this, and I have to do that, and I have to do that, abide in the vine. And you will find a rest and a peace and a satisfaction that can be found nowhere else. I felt strongly that the point of the sermon 
today isn't a here are four keys on how to be a better son, but it is an invitation, a love letter from Jesus to his bride, saying, come away with me. Shout out to that Nora Jones song. It's a great song. Jordan, you appreciated that. Thanks. Luke 7, verse 37, and behold, the woman of the city who was a sinner, when she had learned that he, that Jesus, was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. You see, she understood in that moment, despite her reputation and what everybody would think of her showing up in this holy man, this Pharisee's house, that there was something more precious than her reputation. There was something more precious than the costly jar of perfume that she worked at, spent many days earning the the wages for. There was Jesus, her beloved. Yesterday, I was mowing the lawn. Anybody else mow the lawn yesterday? I asked this in first service. I don't know why. Got a couple people. Shout out, mowing the lawn. And um, <laughs> I'm, mowing, I'm mowing the lawn, and I, I felt the Lord tell me, sometimes we'll listen through our sermons. Praise God for 2024. You can just put Siri, read your sermon to you that you've prepared. And I felt the Lord say, don't. Just listen to some worship. And so I, I was just listening to worship. And out comes my daughter, Zoe, and she's got her little headphones on, and she's walking up to me to come ride the, mo- the lawnmower with me. And I, got, I have a zero-turn lawnmower, and, you know, I'm just going to be really, really frank with you all this morning. It's a little bit inconvenient to ride with your kid on a zero-turn lawnmower, because you're, like, pulling the bars. They're sitting on your lap, and they're, like, adding that much more depth, and you're trying to, like, do this. And then my back's like hurting because I'm trying to like sit upright so we don't just like lean too far backwards. We're just, I'm just trying to like navigate this thing. And so I see her coming and I'm a little bit like on the inside, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, um, but I, she's too cute. And so she comes on the lawnmower and we're riding it. And I begin to just sort of feel the Lord encouraging me to embrace the moment. And I begin to just embrace the moment and I'm like, I was on a quarter tank of gas, and one of my biggest concerns yesterday was I'm going to run out of gas and have to go to the gas station. That's going to be really inconvenient and suck. But I just decided to embrace it. And so I'm teaching her how to ride, which is slowing us down. And I'm showing her, no, like, maneuver this. And then then she's all of a sudden, we're going down the hill super fast. I'm like, pull back, pull back. And then I'm showing her again, no, how you do this turns. And we're going in circles. And I'm like, okay. And I'm just being patient with her and teaching her and showing her. And this, this thought occurred to me, or this thought maybe that the Lord placed, rather, in my heart in that moment as I was there with my daughter. Aaron, what's more important? The to-do list that you have for me, of the ways you can serve me, or to just spend time with me? What's more important to me? And as I, was, as I was sitting here between services, so this is a, a freebie for second service only, the Lord reminded me of Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10. <laughs> it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that the Lord, that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. We can try really, really hard 
And there can be a, a point even in our, in our practices in the temple where we can be so numb to everything that we're doing and we're not actually beholding the Lord. Have you ever experienced, your, you've decided, I'm going to spend time with the Lord today, and you've you got worship music on, you're reading your Bible, and all of a sudden it dawns on you, I'm not even communing with the Lord right now in my heart. I'm just going through some checklist I created of how this is, these are the steps of how I spend time, how you are to spend time with the Lord. And he is saying, come and be with me, my beloved. And sometimes he'll just say, I just want you to set, set the word down. The word's good, but right now I just want you to worship him. I just want you to lay prostrate before me. Even in our worship, let the Lord lead you. Let him guide you. Don't fall into the temptation that you need to create the list of how to please God. Just be with him. Nothing can fill that God ache in our lives. No substance, no busyness, no person, not even our spouse. If you're unmarried, I'm just going to break it to you right now. Your spouse cannot satisfy the longings of your heart like Jesus. Satisfaction is found in him, and he has invited us into the fellowship, that friendship. You know, this idea that we are the temple is, it's both, and that the Lord literally dwells with us, that his glory dwells with us, like as it once was in Leviticus and Chronicles, and that he was dwelling in these places where we had to go, God now comes with us wherever we go. It's this mind-blowing idea And yet it's also the most natural thing in human history because you were created to dwell with God, to be in relationship with him, to be loved by him. It's it's like peanut butter and jelly, which if you're allergic to peanuts, I'm sorry. But it's, I was trying to sum it up and and this, maybe this doesn't work for you, but it does for me. Like it's like the, the warm embrace of a long lost friend who I'm just so pleased to see. Just like every time it's that, that safety, that warmth, that love, that kindness, that hope. It's not something we have to overthink. It's a matter of the heart, not of the mind. I'm going to ask you to stand. I want us to just take a moment and quiet ourselves. And I'm going to invite you to kind of posh yourself in whatever position or place in the room makes sense for you. I don't want to make a big song and dance, but I feel like this is a holy moment between you and your beloved, your lover, Jesus. And so just take a moment If you need to get on your knees, if you need to bow in your chair, if you need to come forward and lay on the altar, if like whatever, if you want to stay where you are, but just position yourself to commune with him for this moment. He is calling you. I felt him say, as deep calls unto deep, so I am calling into the deep places of my beloved, of my bride. I am calling her. I am wooing her. Come a little closer. Go a little deeper. And I felt the Lord remind me of that that prayer of David's in the book of Psalms. And I want to ask us just to begin by praying this prayer before him. Lord, search me and know me. Lord, search me.
see if there be any wicked way in me. The Lord say there are things we're going to leave here today at the altar that we don't need to go home with. If you need to just start by just repenting to the Lord for the distractions that you have let become idols. Lord, for every other lover... For every lover, for everything that we let become an idol, we repent and we lay it before you at your feet. It might be a little bit silly, but I'm going to go for it. I, and I, I just felt like the Lord's, I heard him say to the angels, clean up on aisle one. <laughs> and I just see his holy angels, his Holy Spirit coming and just taking those things from us. Saying, you don't need these anymore. And I want to invite you to pray this sobering prayer, but I want to caution you not to pray it if you don't mean it. Lord, would you dull the pleasure of the distractions? Just feel the Lord saying, like, do you truly believe that your satisfaction is in me? Do you truly believe that no moment is wasted with me? Do you truly believe that if you carve out that time, if you take time with me, I will leave you wanting? Come, Lord Jesus. And I want to be clear that we are not petitioning God in this moment. We don't petition God to do something he's already done. We don't petition him to do something he already longs to do and is already doing. We are simply surrendering once again. We lay ourselves bare before you, Jesus. Make us dissatisfied. He is speaking, he is speaking. Open your ears, open your ears to your heart. The Lord reminded me this morning, this pastor, this friend we knew that that wouldn't take marriage counseling couples, he wouldn't take on counseling them unless they committed to praying together. Oh, come on, Jesus. Even in our marriages, Lord, we carve out time for you. where man's wisdom has fallen short in our marriages, in our broken homes. Christ be magnified. (sighs) Where the sting has been so great and we have been unable to forgive our spouse when they cheated on us, when they wronged us so great, Christ be magnified. Where we have broken reputation with our children or our parents and we have scorned their teaching. Christ be magnified. you're a student in this room, you might just need to begin and repent before the Lord in this holy moment for ways in which you have dishonored your parents. 
I don't know. I'm just going with what I feel the Lord say. For ways you've scorned their teaching, you've rejected and you've rebelled, and you've even spewed hurtful things to their hearts. Christ be magnified. Christ be magnified. Jesus, would you mark us? This is a holy moment, but this moment will not carry you alone. This sermon will not carry you alone, but Christ can. So Christ, I ask that you would burn in every heart. Burn away all the additives, all the noise, all the distractions. God, I ask that you would not let us off easy today. Those that once dreamed dreams and had visions in the night will dream again, will see again. Those whose voice, whose Whose your voice has become dull will hear you clearly once again. Speak, we are listening. Breathe on the coals, God. Come on, if you need a fresh baptism of fire, would you just come down to the front for a moment? Come before him on your knees. And I'm going to ask our ministry team just to begin to lay hands. Go all around this place and lay hands and just impart the fire. God, we need your fire. We don't take it for granted. We don't take it for granted. Ministry team, don't pray petitioning prayers. Release the fire that is already available. Don't beg God to show up. He's already with you. And even if you're here at the altar, this is simply your another demonstration of your surrender. This this isn't some like secret recipe to success. You have to come down here. But it's just an outward sign of your surrender. Fire of God. Come.